Good morning and thank you uh, for joining us uh, today again. After uh, yesterday's meeting uh, discussing all the challenges and today we have experts from the advisory committee to uh, explain uh, what we're doing. And for this purpose we have Joaquin Nieto, Jesus Martin Lunares, Ismael Adnar, and Jesus Alquizar. To begin with, Joaquin Nieto is coordinator of the group of experts of the Citizens' Assembly uh, for the Climate. Whenever you're ready, thank you. Es un privilegio. It's a privilege to take part in this uh, process this uh, conference on building the future with uh, such an interesting initiative uh, as the one you're carrying out uh, by an institution like Abasca Provincial Council and in particular the uh, Provincial Council uh, of Guipúzcoa. It's a fairly unique kind of institution which gives you uh, a mandate and a responsibility that are also unique. And the uh, possibilities uh, of uh, taking measures, and I think that we can, should congratulate you on uh, how it's being done. It's very really different to how it was done 15 years ago or 10 years ago even. So my first words of congratulation are for the approach you've uh, shown us over these two days um, with regard to this uh, project uh, to build the future. It's an approach that considers the various dimensions involved. It's not just the envir environmental dimension, but obviously there are other dimensions, obviously the economic and social dimensions, although they're not the only one. And I like to talk about dimensions and not pillars because the interaction uh, between them is enormous. There are also uh, ethical dimensions uh, that have come up in the presentations and cultural dimensions such as the uh, ones we experienced this morning, which are very important. And in the video shown yesterday on the uh, transformation uh, of the various sectors in the Basque Country and in Gipuzka. In particular, I thought were very thought-provoking. So it's important to uh, look at the subject from all these dimensions. From my personal experience, I come from uh, the uh, trade union world. And because of my age, I uh, even participated in the workers' studies against Franco before democracy. and. Uh, after that, uh, I've uh, defended workers' rights in a changing world, and I have been able to contribute to uh, including the environmental dimension in uh, the labor dimension, but also including the labor agenda in the uh, environmental agenda and the climate agenda. And I've dedicated many years of my life to uh, international um, climate agenda negotiations and defending these agendas and also, as I'll mention later, the uh, fair transition. And talking about transitions, another virtue of uh, this Edor Kisuna Eraikis Building the Future conference is uh, that uh, the view is dynamic. In a world that's uh, changing, in a change of era, a change of era that is uh, determined by some macro trends, including the environmental trend, the energy and environmental transition 
that are essential to avoid a climate change and also to avoid a social environmental collapse that threatens this society and threatens civilization. And one of the factors explaining uh, this uh, changing world is accompanied by others, of course, technology changes, uh, which for some people uh, is uh, essential, and it is key. The digitization process is uh, changing our world, our way of uh, working, producing, and consuming, our way of uh, relating, and it's doing it very quickly in a global world. And all this means that it's not just another industrial revolution, it's a very unique industrial revolution. And these two macro trends, um, the climate uh, and environmental uh, changes, the energy and environmental uh, transition, and the digital transition are accompanied by others that are equally important, the rights of women. Changes in the uh, gender view of society, it's a revolutionary change. In 10,000 years, uh, this had never happened. Women were in a subordinate position, and they've said no. And they have every right in the world to play their role in society. They have the right to equal opportunities and uh, playing uh, the role that you're already playing. And it was spectacular yesterday to uh, listen to the presentations from the director for the environment and uh, the uh, councillor for transport. It was spectacular to uh, see them uh, as leaders. This uh, transformation is uh, enormous, and it's also changing our world, and we need to consider it as well as others. Demographic changes that have uh, a major influence. Societies uh, like the European, uh, Spanish, and uh, Basque demographies, uh, where fewer uh, people are being born than those that are dying, and uh, there's another world in uh, sub-Saharan Africa with a 14 percent uh, growth rate, which means that the population will double. And uh, together uh, with uh, climate change and uh, international uh, travel and uh, uh, enormous uh, migration flows, there's uh, twice the migration today that there was at the beginning of the century and half of what there will be in 15 or 20 years. We have almost uh, 300 million displaced persons, uh, refugees, uh, migrants, and soon we will have 500. And although migration accompanies the history of humankind, 500 million migrants have an enormous impact, and all this will have to be coordinated. So everything we're discussing here is being discussed uh, in a context of a very significant uh, change. And uh, you're doing this uh, in the context of uh, post-pandemic. Well, it's still a pandemic, but uh, in a post-pandemic recovery process. And this is key because that uh, recovery could be a very promising scenario, but it depends on how things are done. And uh, conferences uh, like these certainly help uh, us uh, to uh, organize the way we think, to do things uh, collaboratively, and to understand all of these issues that are interlinked and uh, use them to take the opportunity of uh, uh, rebuilding uh, the world after this uh, pandemic. And there are other groups that are going to discuss uh, other things, the social dimension, how to maintain and improve uh, the welfare system, in the presentation by Cynthia yesterday, she said the uh, threats or what's going to happen to the European welfare state. Well, perhaps uh, the approach should be what should we do to maintain and strengthen the European welfare state, which is not uh, just the key that uh, makes it possible uh, to coexist and have a social contract in Europe, but one is one of the keys uh, that uh, could uh, enable a social uh, contract uh, worldwide to uh, solve these issues, because uh, the high levels of uh, inequality are uh, an obvious uh, challenge. But here we're, we're here to do, discuss the environment. It's uh, uh, impressive. 
the uh, number of lines of actions, of uh, objectives, of goals, actions, measures you've taken in such a small place, even uh, it's uh, as uh, important and as dynamic as uh, Giputhwa through its provincial council. So we have to congratulate you and anyone that's been committed uh, to the environment, uh, if they look back and if they uh, try to find leaders with that level of knowledge uh, and uh, engagement and inter-institutional uh, collaboration to uh, develop uh, all the measures uh, that uh, you've developed, uh, well, the first thing we need to do is to congratulate you because you deserve those congratulations. And there are some things that stand out more than others. I would emphasize in the field of energy, for example, the initiative taken by those uh, energy communities, energy cooperatives. These communities are a different sort of initiative in public spaces, in municipal spaces uh, that uh, are made available to install renewable energy for a self-consumption and distributed uh, energy project so that uh, people's uh, homes can self-consume at uh, very uh, attractive uh, investment levels, two, three thousand euros, as you explained here. And uh, uh, this is very significant uh, considering the current price of uh, electricity. And uh, there's uh, also a dual interest uh, in this because one of the main contributions that can be made uh, to prevent uh, catastrophic climate change is uh, not just uh, a matter of generating renewable energy, but doing it on a distributed basis and with self-consumption, because the problem isn't just the source of energy. It's also a matter of reducing energy consumption. We need to save. We have uh, to uh, bring about the initiatives uh, that can help achieve this. And uh, these initiatives aimed at companies and aimed at homes uh, can uh, be an example for all the best country, for all of Spain and all of Europe. So I think that uh, one of the initiatives that you explained yesterday that uh, has the greatest potential, and uh, by what you said, I imagine that the development is only starting, but this is one of the initiatives with the greatest potential. And uh, when I talk about uh, things uh, that uh, are being done. This is one of the initiatives I'll be talking about, these cooperatives and this uh, energy consumption system. I was also impressed, and I would like to highlight this, I was impressed by the effort made uh, around public transport. The awareness uh, that making an effort uh, around public transport uh, to better organize it, to make it more accessible to citizens and to, to uh, make it possible for all citizens to have access uh, to uh, proper transportation. I thought that the whole approach was very interesting because it was a very uh, complete approach. There was a social approach, there was an environmental approach, and a climate approach. And uh, when you gave the results, uh, the uh, biggest emission reduction in the province came from achievements in transport. And this hasn't happened spontaneously. It had to do with uh, a thought out action in an area where the provincial council has competences, it has the mandate, and can therefore do everything it has done. So my congratulations again. I think it's uh, an example. What the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council has done can be done by many other urban, peri-urban, or even rural bodies, it will be more difficult because this uh, is a, a community with fairly integrated uh, towns. It's uh, not a, a major conurbation, but uh, towns are very closely related, so uh, you have good conditions and you've made good use of them. And uh, uh, I asked about uh, transport to the workplace. And I know that uh, good 
public transport system solves 80% of the problem, but perhaps we need to solve the other 20% of the problem. And the things that can only be done if we work on the details and if we're aware of the details uh, and the uh, trips that are related to each uh, kind of activity. And one of the most uh, important types of trips are trips to work. Not every day now, because we're going to still have uh, work from home, which uh, is going to be a very interesting perspective. But uh, people, uh, or most people, have to uh, travel to work uh, at least two or three times a week. And access to transport has uh, improved uh, so that these trips uh, can be done by using uh, public transport and not uh, private transport, or uh, it's made easier through public transport, but I'm sure that there's room for improvement and that you'll be able to uh, make this improvement uh, because your track uh, record is very promising. And uh, if this can be uh, complemented uh, with uh, other areas, I'm sure that this can be of major interest. And then we have all the questions about what about the uh, private uh, sector, the electrification of the private sector, etc. things that go beyond the competencies of the provincial council. But uh, I think uh, that uh, you'll be thinking about uh, what uh, can be done. I'm sure you won't overlook that after all the important things you've already done. And uh, serious progress has been made in uh, waste collection, waste separation, the participation of citizens, and like many of the things that you've done, this has been the result of a conflict, and this means that the society is alive. There was a society that was against an incineration plant, and this led to a conflict, and um, policymakers realized that they had to do something about it. They had to explain things to citizens, uh, propose things to citizens, and uh, in the end, When you're responsible about your mandate, uh, you end up uh, with uh, uh, such a complete uh, program as the one you've developed. But I think that there's special sensitivity regarding uh, waste, and this has led uh, to a significant recovery and uh, separation uh, policies with significant results. That uh, figure of 52 percent is a significant figure, and it's an example compared to other territories that don't have those results and could have them. And uh, again, we have to uh, consider the progress that has been made. Another aspect uh, that drew uh, my attention was the issue of the indicators. It's impossible to have good, serious policies uh, and it's impossible to obtain results without having indicators that will tell you what you've done well, what you haven't, where you can make progress and where you can't. And this also shows uh, the uh, commitment uh, towards our citizens. Today, the administrations are full of plans and programs, but they're not uh, full of uh, indicators with uh, uh, results and uh, analyses and uh, accountability before the citizenship. I didn't have time to look at the characteristics of the indicators uh, carefully, uh, how they're done, how they're monitored, how they're reported on. But there is uh, an apparently powerful chapter on indicators, which is something to be highlighted. And it would be good to know how this is actually working and whether all the indicators are on time, whether citizens are aware of them, whether the external and internal accountability works where there's internal and external stock taking, all this, if it's uh, being done properly, well, great, it should continue. And uh, if not, uh, it's uh, something that uh, I would uh, suggest uh, you uh, make uh, the most of. Uh, use the full potential of the indicators because this is the key to success. And uh, since I'm making suggestions on uh, things uh, that could be added, and I mentioned uh, public transport. In the area of uh, circular economy, I would like uh, to make a reflection. Sometimes, uh, too often, the circular economy is uh, reduced to waste, and the circular economy is more than waste. 
I know that in the end, the administrations, not just the Kuputhkwa Provincial Council, but the administrations, the competence they have left is what to do with the industrial waste and the urban waste. And how to uh, manage uh, a very complex issue, and there's never a perfect solution because waste never has a, a perfect solution. But they don't have the capability, they don't have the competences uh, to look into the other process, the process that goes from the uh, design through the industrial processes or the buying and selling uh, processes and uh, the marketplace uh, that produce uh, that waste. You don't decide on the packaging or uh, single-use uh, packaging. You don't uh, design uh, construction sites. You don't design the machines. The machines uh, built in Gipuzkoa or the machines built outside Gipuzkoa, which are most of them, and they're bought and brought to Gipuzkoa. And that's the real universe of the circular economy. And even though you don't have competencies over that, uh, the few you do have should be included because uh, some things are produced in Gipuzkoa. Gipuzkoa is one of the most important industrial areas in the world. You are already uh, produced uh, shotguns uh, 300 years ago, and they worked, uh, which was technologically complex. So there's a very important uh, industrial tradition in this province. So, and uh, examples can be given as to how from design through the industrial processes and in waste uh, management, uh, how all that uh, can be based on the idea of a circular economy. But there is this idea that the circular economy is broader. And yesterday, uh, we went to see the Natur Klima Center, a uh, great center. I also congratulate you on that center. And uh, some uh, projects were shown to us. And uh, one of them was fantastic. And the presentation was uh, extraordinary, given by uh, the uh, lady in charge of the initiative about the uh, recycling of uh, coffee uh, capsules. It was uh, great, but uh, those uh, coffee capsules didn't exist 15 years ago. So. Uh, These unsolvable problems can be uh, resolved through the circular economy. And uh, we can avoid uh, using unnecessary problems. Natur Klima has to find a way of solving that uh, coffee capsule issue. But uh, uh, we have to especially look at the world of plastics, which is a very a severe problem. And we have to look into uh, whether all the plastic that's produced uh, and all the plastics uh, that's uh, used uh, in the market is acceptable or not. And all this forms part of the circular economy that uh, we should look at in a more uh, complete way than uh, just uh, the uh, re reutilization of waste. We can favor reutilization and recovery. as well as recycling. But there's a hierarchy in the Rs. It's better to reuse, to reutilize. It's better to reduce than uh, reutilize, and it's better to reutilize than to recycle. And we have to maintain that hierarchy. And uh, I think that this uh, is also the, something that should be present in the circular economy. And there are many things that you're going to be able to add because you've done a very good job. Yesterday, how we heard at Natur Klima, how the impacts of climate uh, change uh, are having on an area like Gipuzkoa are being studied. This will probably give you clues, not just uh, to adopt uh, a general uh, program, but specific uh, measures. So I think that uh, the potential for development uh, through new measures, through the environmental plan you're promoting, is uh, clear. And I also have to say, although uh, the uh, president of the Provincial Council is not here, 
But some initiatives like this uh, green hydrogen initiative, I think they're going to be more controversial than uh, they seem. And I think uh, that uh, calling these initiatives uh, green is somewhat uh, controversial. It's my obligation to make the comment, and uh, I'm uh, making the comment most sincerely. But uh, thank you once again for inviting me to participate here. But especially, I'd like to thank the uh, administration and the environmental team for its committee commitment. It looks like a small team, but uh, it's an uh, enormous effort uh, that has been made, as we saw in the presentation from David Lapuente. So once again, congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you, Joaquin. We're now going to hand the floor over to the second speaker, the uh, DG for the Environment from the European Commission. Welcome. Bueno, pues me toca hablar después de Joaquín. Well, it's my turn to speak after Joaquín, and that's a complicated job because he's practically said everything I wanted to say. So uh, forgive me if uh, I uh, step off a clear path because I'm going to try to uh, adapt what I plan to talk about. The task I've been given here consisted in making an assessment, a sort of evaluation of the program. And uh, this is somewhat daring or even pretentious because, uh, of course, uh, I'm going by what has been presented to us over these two days and the documentation have been sent. I don't know the program from inside to be able to make a, a more fair evaluation. And, of course, I have very uh, few negative uh, to say. And you'll be thinking, well, this guy just wants to be invited again next year. And he's flattering us. But uh, um, I'm going to look at the challenges, the activities under development, and more than the strengths and weaknesses I'd like uh, to look at uh, what I found missing. That doesn't mean it hasn't been developed, but maybe they just haven't been presented. And then during the uh, discussion, perhaps we can go into it in greater depth. I work at the European Commission, so obviously uh, I, my evaluation is biased by European policies. And uh, a first reflection I would make is that what's been presented over these two days follows a logic that's very similar to that used by the European Union, or rather by the European Commission, especially in the uh, European Green Deal. We always talk about climate change, but we know that uh, we are facing three or four, depending on who the interlocutor is, three or four environmental crises that are interrelated. Climate change is one of them, and it's essential, but also the loss of biodiversity. Monica explained this very well yesterday. We have another one, pollution. And this is something that hasn't been dealt with as much. So this is a little critique. So you won't say it's all flattery. It was uh, somewhat implicit in some of the presentations, but uh, it's something that I found missing. And the third one, or what uh, is used in the jargon with the UN, etc., they usually talk about three crises and excessive exploitation of resources, which is a sort of catalyst of all of them, or the fourth crisis, if you like, this uh, excessive exploitation of resources. So the European Green Deal has the aim of solving these three or four crises in a systemic and coherent manner. And this follows what science is telling us. We uh, cannot uh, have the aim of uh, solving uh, the climate change by hurting biodiversity. And Monica explained this very well. The ecosystemic uh, systems provided by nature are necessary for uh, mitigation and adaptation. And this is a first very important point, because often in public policies, even uh, in the European Union, let's not uh, fool ourselves, we tend to segment. I work on climate, and this is climate. And other problems like pollution are the problem of another department. So this is a point uh, that uh, I thought uh, was very positive. A second very positive point, uh, too, related with one of the priorities of the European Green Deal is a very strong focus on inequality, how we have to achieve a uh, fair transition. And you know that the European Green Deal has this principle of not uh, leaving anyone behind. But what I enjoyed here in particular was that there were very specific uh, cases as been explained by Joaquin, the case of mobility. I think this approach was explained uh, very clearly. 
and uh, often, and I'm going to throw a uh, rock at my own a roof, we often discuss this at the Commission, but uh, it's often just a discourse because of competence issues, etc. There are not such clear measures to uh, prevent these uh, inequalities in the transition process. And then the measures underway, this uh, systemic uh, and coherent strategic view has been taken to very specific actions, and uh, especially with a follow-up that's based on data. Yesterday, I was very much impressed at Natur Klima when we were given quite a lot of details on the uh, climate data monitoring and how it's been uh, taken to a, a district level. I now work for the DG for the Environment, but for many years I've worked on research on the environment, and my colleagues um, that uh, were in charge of uh, uh, climate, they said we're very good at global modeling, but it's much more difficult to reach the local level. Well, here we have an example of how that's being done. And uh, we were told uh, that there was an interest for uh, local collectives, uh, town councils, etc. But I think that there's an enormous potential for businesses. Uh, insurance companies are, are an obvious choice. We have to ensure climate risk too. And uh, we know that there's a, a gap, a very big leap. Many of the uh, risks are not being insured. and. We've had uh, flooding recently. I haven't uh, followed it up in detail, but I'm sure that there will be expenses that are not covered by insurance companies. We'll have to go to what they're called to the insurance consortium. So there's a great potential of development beyond the interest of the public administration. I've uh, collaborated with the Provincial Council and I knew about the work they were doing on circular economy that I believe is a great example. And you have the data uh, there to uh, show it. And I also really liked, and Joaquin explained this really well, the work on uh, energy cooperatives and communities. Right now, the European Commission started to work on an initiative and uh, solar energy. And one of the things we want to enhance are energy communities and self-consumption. We don't talk so much about cooperatives, but the example presented here would be very useful for the European Commission. And in fact, if you will allow me, when we have uh, meetings, I will uh, tell them about this example because I believe it's a really good one because we don't talk about cooperatives about on a European level, but they have great potential. What I lacked where there was to that you didn't speak about the self-consumption. So that is those that have their own solar panels in their own homes. Uh, in apartment buildings, it is more complex, but if you live in a, a farmhouse or a... Um, a mm, standalone home, it's easier, and many homes are working on this uh, self consumption. What about the um, strengths and weaknesses? More than weaknesses, there are ideas I would like to have to go on more in depth, and maybe we have time to do so in the discussion. And one of them is adaptation to climate change, which was uh, implicit in the conversation, but not in an uh, evident manner. We also know adaptation to climate change is the um, um, poor brother of mitigation. Now, even in the uh, COP, we talked about being more ambitious with adaptation and more funding. But in many cases, there are many strategies at all levels, uh, global, national, local. But uh, implementation is much more complex. And what are the specific measures to be put in place? The example of uh, floods uh, these days uh, has been very interesting because strategies that have been uh, followed uh, regarding um, how we change the paths of the uh, uh, rivers is something we need to change. In the case of Guipuzcoa, there's a high density of population. So in a town like Tolosa, I cannot imagine what we can do or in Renteria to uh, give space uh, for uh, flooding when everything is urban areas. And the same thing happened this summer in Germany and uh, in Belgium, which uh, produced uh, many more victims. Here, there's only been one victim in Navarra, if I'm not uh, wrong. But this is something we should work uh, more in depth, and maybe this is a uh, thing Natur Klima can address. 
Another uh, issue or subject I missed in the discussions uh, here, because the, later on uh, I did have a specific conversations on it, and that is how there's been a process to get up to what we've done. There have been hurdles, there have been different uh, public uh, positions. So to get to know the process well, for example, the incinerator is a paradigmatic example, would be a very good um, example for other regions that want to work maybe uh, not on an incineration uh, plant, but uh, develop a big uh, wind farms or solar farms. There's always a resistance. Or now we talk more about offshore energy. Do we mind uh, having uh, this offshore energy uh, right in front of us, even though we need it? Maybe at yeah, the uh, Paseo Nuevo, we don't have enough wind for it, but there we can find a position. So knowing about the process that has been followed would be also something very positive. We also talked about renewables, not so much about energy efficiency regarding uh, refurbishment of uh, buildings, which I believe will be one of the fundamental pillars in European policies nowadays and also in the next generation EU. Much of the money is uh, going to uh, refurbishment of uh, buildings, and we didn't address this either. And another um, thing I missed, and maybe it's not a problem, but that is the the cooperation between institutions. Is cooperation working well with uh, town councils? Or maybe due to different reasons and initiative of the provincial council is not something taken up by uh, um, the uh, city councils or town councils or the other way around. And to conclude, because I think I've gone over uh, the time allocated to me, in Gipuzkoa, I'm um, uh, from uh, San Sebastian, and we have the character we have, but I think that the work that is being done should be disseminated much uh, more, and even internationally, so we should uh, publicize it more. If we were British or from the Netherlands or even from Bilbao, these uh, things would be uh, better known. On the other hand, and listening to this morning's uh, presentation, this... Uh, made me reflect what I saw as something negative. Maybe it's, it isn't so much. The um, speaker talked about trial and error and experimenting. The fact that we don't spend uh, resources and energy in marketing helps us uh, test uh, more and experiment uh, more. And in the case of the incineration plant, uh, um, we have a very good example of how even though there were problems and opposition, um, I don't want to be superficial about it, but little by little, step by step, we reach an acceptable solution. And that's the idea of uh, trial and error. So maybe it's not uh, so bad and not to communicate as much. So this is my uh, vision, and I hope later on we can continue discussing uh, all of these issues. Thanks. Jesus, your mask. Thank you, Jesus. Now we have uh, Jesus Martinez Linares, who will be talking about circular energy and uh, climate change, and he works for uh, Clima Limpio. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, trust and hospitality. It's always a pleasure to come back to San Sebastian. Uh, it was difficult for Jesus to speak after Joaquin. Imagine, in my case, I have to speak after both of them, and I don't want to be uh, redundant. And as we will have time in the roundtable later on, I would like to present my recommendations as an expert uh, uh, scientist. and. I will be concentrating in this first presentation 
in something that I believe is essential, and that is uh, the uh, narrative or the story. And uh, we will leave the technical side of things for the uh, panel session. As uh, uh, advisors, we've read the 80 pages in the uh, dossier, and we can see Alfonso Feta was a part of it. But as you can see that I got to the end, I'm going to speak about the epilogue just at the end of it, which is very interesting. It says that the data has uh, substituted uh, narratives, but that the first are forgotten, but the narrative or story remains. It remains because it engages us uh, as uh, people and uh, with our experiences. So I believe it's the time for the, to create these uh, narratives and stories. We need these stories to bring together science, conscience, uh, public administrations, and citizenship. What is not communicated doesn't exist. You do many things uh, well, but we need to disseminate this information. We need to reach out to the citizenship to uh, create a community, a vision community regarding a shared uh, future project. As you say at the end of this presentation, you want to uh, uh, confront your uh, story with us as experts. So I will be telling you about uh, mine. I'm a we are um, supporting ourselves on the planet too much and we are destroying it. We've uh, gone in as an elephant in a china shop and we are destroying uh, um, climate and we are homo elephantis. It's like... Uh, having 600,000 Hiroshima bombs every day. And 93% of all this extra energy is right here under the sea. We are also the greenhouse homo. For many years, we've been intensely burning fossil fuels until we saturated the atmosphere. And 80% of its matter is only in the first 12 kilometers, and we have an enormous amount of a greenhouse effect uh, gases on this uh, small uh, varnish that uh, is uh, what uh, life depends on so that we can survive. The Earth, in fact, uh, 300,000 years ago, there was also a high concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the Earth and its geology has a slow way and safe way of setting this underground. But the uh, smart guy in the class, uh, humans, has seen how they can, like a um, time machine, go back in time and take all this enormous amount of emissions 42 uh, billion uh, tons yearly, an indecent amount, and has put it in another carbon cycle that is completely different. So we're not um, uh, playing uh, um, at the same level as uh, nature. And we're also causing the beginning of the sixth uh, massive extinction since there is life on Earth. The extinction rhythm of species is 1,000 times more than the natural one. Uh, while we were speaking yesterday, which we, we had a wonderful day here at the Congress, but it wasn't a great day for biodiversity because 150 species were um, extinguished uh, yesterday. So as Jesus said, there is a multiple um, uh, collision. The uh, domino pieces have started to fall and the question is, how much more time do we have left? In my book, uh, Titanic Planet, uh, I say 10 years to save the world, and I speak about this issue. And of course, we are also like a yeast. When I was uh, born, and many of you, 
and there was uh, half the number of inhabitants on planet Earth. But our impact uh, grows even more than our demography. In 2050, there will be more tons of plastic than of uh, fish out there in the ocean. We've uh, made nature uh, to be full of uh, waste, uh, and now we're paying for it. Climate change for economists is a, a big failure of the market, a negative scenario that means that things are not valued for what they cost. However, we follow this a blind sociology that has created this big existential threat called a climate emergency. But on the other hand, and as Jesus also said, humans are also a wonderful uh, creature and with their creativity and imagination have been able to bring us out of the caves, create a wonderful uh, symphonies like the one that uh, um, Monica uh, uh, showed me of her uh, um, daughter uh, playing on the piano, working in a collaborative uh, manner as you do every day and to learn, learn. That is the key element to learn from each other. Yesterday, we saw that artificial intelligence uh, allows robots to learn in a simultaneous manner, but we don't. We need to be here together, talk, listen to each other, and that's why it's so important to organize events such as this one. And also, the uh, population in the world has uh, doubled, but also many interesting things uh, happen. A man of uh, uh, color said, I had a dream. And there was a big wave in the U.S. of a movement uh, for civil rights. I saw JFK convincing a whole country so that they would uh, work uh, together so that in one only decade, what we read, need right now, they were able to uh, put a man on the moon, a small step for uh, mankind. Uh, for a man, but a big step for mankind. So it's uh, the man on the moon moment for Europe and now, as Monica said. And Jesus, I know that 500 years ago, Europe was able to enlighten the world with the Renaissance, having a man at the center of everything. And now we face uh, the historic opportunity of amazing the world once again. Europe is leading the process. We need to continue leading this process. We have to get on the train, yes or yes. We cannot uh, doubt. We have to jump and leap with uh, Europe to have a state or content, continent project. No, a humanity project, because we can go back to amazing the world. This uh, time, not only putting the man but um, the planet on the center of everything and as uh, the way of uh, measuring uh, absolutely everything. In 2008, I had the opportunity of participating as a speaker on um, circular economy in the Obama summit. Some of you were there. And uh, I was uh, really moved when Obama said it's about people. We are the change uh, we are seeking for. I remembered another great leader, Mr. Gandhi, that said, uh, you can be yourself the change you want to see in the world. And get it wrong, do it, communicate, learn. Those are the values that we are sharing uh, here uh, today. That's why tomorrow morning, uh, yesterday morning, I was really moved when I listened to Marga Lolano uh, speaking about uh, building the future being a new way of uh, governance. In this uh, moment of uh, loneliness uh, and uh, of uh, politics not being part of society, it was really refreshing to hear someone communicate and speak in such a manner and bringing together politics uh, with uh, society, going to an open and collaborative uh, governance model. A new way of uh, governing is a new way of listening and a new way of experimenting. Because as you say in the epilogue of the uh, dossier, as you've seen, uh, um, it really uh, shocked me. 
and you invite us to uh, compare your narrative and ours, and I will say what I observe and I, what I've uh, seen here in Guipúzcoa, in San Sebastian. I see people that wants to elevate the quality of its democracy through citizenship participatory um, processes. I see the Torquisuna Arrakis as a big lab of ideas to uh, improve participation as a cross-cutting tool in moments where problems are cross-cutting, as a tool to incorporate what is global and, uh, and local where big uh, problems are global. And that's why, Jose Ignacio, I really uh, enjoyed your words because this was a clear example of how Natur Clima, the Natur Clima Foundation, that I follow from a distance with great hope because you have a lot to say, a lot to contribute and you have uh, uh, many eyes in you, but we have to learn how to communicate this in an efficient manner. You are much more than what you believe to be. One of the bigger problems of our times, and I also go back to what Victor Lapuente said this morning, is the trust uh, crisis in uh, society with our uh, government systems after the global financial crisis a decade ago. The economy has to do with uh, trust and politics too. Trust is the fundamental social capital to be able to structure our coexistence. Therefore, for me, a Turkey Sunai Raikis is not only a good idea and a necessary one, it's an institution that demonstrates that, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future is of uh, those that believe in the beauty of their dreams. Thank you. Now I have a surprise, a gift. Uh, uh, you will be the first uh, to see this. And this comes uh, uh, after Obama talked about it being about people. I'm as, as I'm a quantum uh, physics, I always ask myself, uh, how many, how many people, how many people do we need to be able to solve something? Because uh, the um, started in uh, Paris, but it doesn't go at a uh, speedy enough. In Glasgow, we observe that with the national uh, emissions reduction uh, plans, we go to 2.7 degrees and not 1.5. So we need to uh, double the efforts. How do we do this? I discovered I work of the Har uh, Erika Kennedy from the Harvard School of Economics that discovered, uh, looking through history, that if in a peak moment there is a 3.5 of the population involved as uh, activists, then it's unstoppable. So estimating this, I think it's, it has to be a 1.5% of the population. So 1.5% uh, of the uh, population that can avoid the temperature going over 1.5 degrees. And do you know who the citizens are? It's you. It's you. So that's why from the Sustenta Foundation, we've launched a civic international movement to put the planet at the center of things. And I will be showing you the first video of this movement where you will see uh, yourselves uh, reflected. You will see that one of the uh, uh, pillars, and that's why I feel at home here, is what I uh, call extreme uh, cooperation, XSC, between citizens, public administrations, and uh, companies. Because only through this extreme cooperation, we will be able to uh, face on time the uh, challenge. We're the last generation that can solve the problem. Uh, the Chinese uh, have a saying that says, I hope you live in interesting times. And I do believe we live in interesting times. But you know what else? We're going to achieve it. We will do so if we're able to work with uh, the SDGs and this big uh, alliance for the planet to um, have uh, all the narrations in a collective uh, symphony that we call sustainability. 
So this is the big alliance for the planet. Resulta curioso cómo el ser humano se ha acostumbrado a vivir sentado en un cómodo sillón. Nos pasamos los días consumiendo debates vacíos, juzgando a los que intentan hacer de este planeta un lugar mejor. Escépticos y convencidos de que hay ciertos problemas demasiado grandes para la acción de una sola persona. Pero esa verdad que no queremos escuchar y que por eso callamos con tanto ruido es que todos estamos a bordo de este planeta y que este planeta se va a estrellar. Bienvenidos al planeta Titanic. La buena noticia es que el iceberg no es el cambio climático. El iceberg somos nosotros. Por eso tenemos que asimilar dos cosas. La primera es que nuestras acciones, por pequeñas que sean, pueden y hacen la diferencia. La segunda es que nos quedan menos de 10 años para que los efectos del calentamiento global sean ya irreversibles. Por eso necesitamos una gran alianza por el planeta que pueda generar un impacto social. Así nace el GAP, un movimiento de personas, de activadores y generadores de cambio, a los que no los mueven grandes ideales, sino la suma de pequeños logros. Así, buscan inspirar desde el ejemplo para poco a poco alcanzar el gran objetivo de construir un mundo mejor. Aprovechemos la última oportunidad que tenemos para virar el rumbo de nuestro planeta Titanic. Sustenta Environmental Civic Association. Pon al mundo en... So you have the world in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. And now to finish, we have Ismael Aznar from the Ecologic Transition Ministry. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this Congress and giving us the opportunity of speaking about what you're doing, which, uh, uh, as Jesus said, it's um, uh, difficult for me because if I would examine my own administration, uh, probably I would be much more critic than I will be today because as other speakers have said, um, being the last one means that many of the significant things have already been said. Many things are being done in Kipuzkoa and they're doing it really uh, well, especially if we compare it to the work of other administrations that are um, behind you. You're doing things well, which doesn't mean that there are elements that can be improved, because in this kind of issues, as you know, the emergency is such, the dimension of the change is, uh, is so uh, um, huge that we're always a bit behind what is necessary. So there's always an improvement capacity. And as there's a, uh, you ask us for a critical analysis, that's what I will be doing. And first of all, let me start with this comment that I cannot uh, avoid. And it doesn't have so much to do with the policies developed by the um, Provincial Council regarding the environment and mobility, but uh, with the organization of this conference and what Joaquin said. Right now, at the 21st uh, century, in this advisory committee, there should be a woman. We need to get used to this, and the administration needs to be an example of how in this uh, public uh, spheres uh, we uh, are a showcase uh, for the exterior, and it cannot be all men participating in the uh, advisory committee. As I said, there are things that are being done really well. The previous speakers have mentioned many of them as general director of quality and responsibility for waste policies at a Spanish level. I'm really jealous of the levels of recycling and reuse that you have here in Guipúzcoa. And I wish that in the rest of the territory, we would be in the same uh, situation, the regions and uh, autonomous communities, because we wouldn't be at the level of non-compliance 
with the objectives for 2020, having to cover a very important gap for 2025 and 2030 that we're trying to deal with with different measures like the uh, waste uh, um, uh, policy that is now in the Congress, and we're trying to very quickly uh, give steps forwards. But it is a good example of what could be done in other places. And I believe we should uh, congratulate ourselves uh, about this, not only regarding uh, waste, but also regarding the approach of how to uh, foster a circular economy. When Monica talked uh, about uh, plastics uh, projects yesterday and reuse, um, well, there's still a lot to be done regarding reuse and a lot to be improved. Reuse with uh, textiles, uh, uh, furniture, everything else so that has to do with uh, battery recycling. So this is perfectly aligned with what we're trying to uh, uh, foster uh, at a Spanish level with recycling of uh, textile, also um, recovery of uh, furniture to uh, foster the um, circular economy and plastics uh, economy. We've just heard about uh, chemical uh, recycling and uh, plastic, so when it's not necessary to do so in another way. So we're all uh, working on with the same objective. Joaquin has also mentioned this, and this is also something very positive, the way in which we need to foster self-consumption, which is very important for decarbonization. Uh, self-consumption, energy communities. We believe this is the right path that needs to be uh, enhanced. And if you will uh, allow me to reflect on this, I believe it's not enough. We need to be aware of it not being enough. We also need big uh, wind farms and uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, plants and other renewable sources. Without uh, these big renewable projects, we won't be able to uh, comply with the uh, demand of uh, energy. And of course, we have to work on an efficiency and energy savings set too. And this is a discussion that cannot be avoided. We know that the big uh, renewables, the big uh, wind farms and photovoltaic plants have an impact on the territory. They have an impact on biodiversity. And we have to see where they're located, how we locate them, what are the conditions. I also work on an uh, impact uh, assessment and uh, I see uh, files uh, where I see this is uh, extremely complex, but if we don't address this uh, discussion, then we will see that we don't have the capacity to decarbonize the economy. And if we don't decarbonize the economy, as uh, Jesus uh, said, the other Jesus said, we will be like the Titanic. Uh, we uh, either go against the iceberg, uh, and that will be ourselves, or we do something for decarbonization. This is a discussion that needs to be had. And regarding the territory of Guipúzcoa, yes, it is very uh, complex uh, geographically and taking into account its unique landscape. But if we want to reduce uh, dependency, we have to see what are the niches and opportunities to develop renewables beyond self-consumption. Complejo. Although this is complex, as I said, we're asked to talk about strength, weaknesses, challenges. I think that many of the challenges are shared. Those of us that have public responsibilities face very similar challenges at different levels, on different scales, at different levels of governance, let's say, or of administration. But there's one that uh, is the urgency to act. And uh, I'd like to uh, relate this to the measures uh, we're adopting or designing. We have to work very quickly. We have to uh, carry out uh, a major change in a short time, but we have to get it right, and that's not easy. And uh, running and getting the measures right is not always easy. And uh, here we have to uh, go down into the details. We know we all have to reduce our emissions. We have to decarbonize the economy. We have to increase uh, the generation of renewable energy. We have to uh, review mobility. We have to go towards the electrification of uh, transport or of many sectors. But with what measures and with what incentives, with what regulatory tools? And when you go into the details, you uh, run into complexities. And you run the risk of not getting it right. Uh, not uh, getting the regulations right. And I think that many administrations share this. We've seen examples, and we've been discussing yesterday during lunch. We're saying we're going to promote biomass because it's a renewable source. Well, how? What biomass? 
maybe uh, not that much because uh, it also has its impact uh, in uh, deforestation uh, and biomass uh, may have uh, an impact on air quality. We have to be careful with the collateral effects uh, that uh, certain uh, measures uh, may have. And it's also complex when we uh, go uh, down into the details of uh, what are often called um, transition technologies. And yesterday we discussed mobility, how to renew a fleet. What do I go for? For an electric uh, bus that costs a lot of money, that has uh, range problems, or do I use a gas, do I use a hybrid vehicle? It's often not at all simple, and we have to consider that vehicle I'm going to invest in now is going to uh, be used for years. And if I have uh, a gradual decarbonization horizon for the economy, maybe it's not a very good idea to go to a gas vehicle, even though it's an improvement uh, compared to the petrol vehicle, or should we be braver and go further? But we also have to see how far an administration can go. But these uh, detailed decisions are important, they're complex, and we have to make them very quickly. And squaring that circle is uh, not at all easy, or the debate on renewables. Renewables, yes, uh, at uh, what speed, at what rate, where, it's not easy. A second idea I would like to highlight is that we have sectors where we've identified the solutions to a large extent, and we're working on the uh, electric sector, transport, and there are other sectors that are more complex um, and that uh, need uh, more thought. And uh, uh, we also need to make more determined steps. And yesterday, for example, we were talking about the farming sector. From uh, farm to fork. And uh, the uh, focus was on uh, reducing food waste, which is fantastic. It's another initiative that we're also trying to promote. Uh, on a level of a national government, but where I see a shortcoming and where I think there's a long way to go is in transforming the farming sector to make it sustainable. Even though now we have a new uh, agricultural policy uh, that should push in that direction, and for farmers it's uh, a revolution that, uh, that has put their backs up to some extent. But uh, it's probably not enough to reach our decarbonization uh, goals and to uh, protect biodiversity. In the farming sector, we have uh, some uh, clearly defined problems that can only be resolved uh, by uh, uh, approaching or tackling the problem. Nitrogen, for example, we have uh, ammonium uh, emissions. We also have uh, aquifer uh, nitrate uh, pollution. We, in Spain, we have uh, aquifer pollution uh, produced by nitrates, uh, and 90% um, of the ammonium emissions uh, in um, Spain come from uh, farming waste. And if we don't tackle those problems, we're not going to resolve them. And it's tremendously difficult because it's a very sensitive sector with many economic difficulties. And that's where uh, the uh, big challenges lie. And yesterday, you discussed industry for other reasons. It's also a complex sector because of the economic uh, and social dimension. The difficulty of decarbonizing uh, processes in many sectors is not at all simple. And uh, it's uh, possible to gain in efficiency and reduce emissions, but reaching decarbonization in certain industries is certainly a complicated leap. And I connect this with another element uh, we've also uh, discussed. Well, in this uh, critical analysis, once again, congratulations uh, for uh, tackling these uh, farming and uh, industrial issues, but we'll probably have to go further in the coming years. But uh, I'd like to link this with something I think that's very important and which uh, connects with uh, this conference uh, that uh, stems from an uh, initiative of uh, governance. And that is how we make that uh, change possible. How can we overcome the social resistance to that change? We've spoken about a fair transition of not leaving anyone behind. But I think uh, that we have to go a step further. It's not just uh, a matter of accompanying uh, the most vulnerable, those uh, that may suffer the negative consequences of a change in a model, uh, losing their jobs, and so on. But I think. Uh, 
that uh, we need to provide uh, active support uh, from citizens uh, for these policies that are not always simple. Often we find citizens that share the general discourse, but when you talk about uh, specific measures or impose obligations or open a waste management plant in a municipality, you find resistance uh, logically. And we have to be able, through the governance mechanisms of uh, involving citizens, of putting them at the center, making them feel protagonists of the change, and making them appreciate the benefits of that change. And I think that there are elements where those uh, benefits can be clearly seen. And when we talk about decarbonizing the economy, for uh, reasons of mobility, we also find improvements in air quality, health uh, in the environment, that uh, citizens enjoy, and therefore in their quality of life. Changing mobility may be an opportunity to rethink cities, to make them more human, uh, more uh, livable. And if citizens appreciate that change, and we've seen this in many places, uh, we've seen it uh, without leaving the Basque Country, in the case of Vitoria, which is often used as an example, a city that puts its stake on a more sustainable model that uh, citizens applaud, or Pontevedra where it had been decided to uh, carry out the policy of uh, reducing uh, vehicle access to the city. And this was uh, contested at the beginning. But the mayor of Pontevedra has been there for 20 years after uh, transforming the city. And cities ended up appreciating the advantages of a sustainable model that uh, give them uh, quality of life. But there are other measures we can think about. I recently uh, visited. Uh, waste treatment plant uh, somewhere else in Valencia. And uh, they had uh, prepared a gallery for visitors so that people could visit the plant without uh, having to uh, smell uh, uh, the smells of a waste management plant. And it was tremendously educational. And I think it's very good for citizens. And the uh, managing director uh, said, well, what I've done here, we want to do in another plant. And uh, people are saying, well, why spend uh, so much money on that gallery that doesn't contribute to anything to waste management? Well, of course it contributes. Uh, and because uh, one lady said to me, and I couldn't have felt more proud, this money is money well spent. And we have to uh, manage uh, waste. And we have uh, to make people understand that by managing waste, uh, we uh, avoid them being uh, sent to uh, dumps. If citizens can see that, if they're capable of seeing it and appreciating it, we'll have allies that uh, will make this change possible. And I think that uh, governance initiatives uh, like uh, this, uh, which are new, is uh, tremendously helpful. And uh, I don't know whether this wasn't shown in the presentation uh, yesterday. Perhaps we can discuss it uh, later. Uh, I think we need to understand how this Building the Future program has uh, fed into the uh, policies at the uh, Provincial Council, or how it's planned that they will uh, feed into the policies in the future. But this uh, new proposal is very interesting, this uh, initiative. We need to see how this is uh, reflected in the energy transition measures and uh, the uh, support it has from the citizens. And that's all. I think that with this, I've reviewed the uh, four ideas I wanted to present. I've tried not to uh, uh, repeat too much what the previous uh, speakers uh, have already said, since they covered most of my ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we're going to move on to a uh, discussion with the four advisors and Jose Ignacio Asensio, please. I'm sorry, I'm afraid uh, he's not using a microphone, so I can't hear what he's saying for translation purposes.
¿Cosas del directo? Sí, 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 bueno, no hace, no hace falta. Bueno, mi esquer, Puronetan Partarzati, gracias a todos. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking part in this uh, uh, panel discussion. After your analyses and after your recommendations, we have uh, a number of uh, questions uh, for you. Okay? So, first of all, after everything you've seen and uh, after everything that was explained <coughs> yesterday, do you believe? that uh, Gipuzkoa can be especially sensitive to climate change. What uh, is your perception? Mike? No, I've got the mic, okay. But how are we going to do the translation? It's okay. Uh, it's okay? You don't yes, need translation? Okay, yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, I feel a little bit, uh, I, perhaps I need to explain a little bit my perspectives on what I see in a Turkisunara case uh, in order to answer that question. Um, and perhaps I should also explain where I'm speaking from. Um, so my name is Kirsten Dunlop. I am a partner. Uh, I represent an organization that is partnered with the Diputation uh, Foral of Gipuzkoa uh, and has been working on the deep demonstration for sustainability, bringing together the portfolio of Etorki Sunarahis with a set of perspectives that in, do in fact include decarbonization, adaptation, and the intersection with social cohesion. So my perspective uh, has two pieces to it uh, in response to your question. I think that the approach to climate change itself and to decarbonization and adaptation needs to be significantly more ambitious and transformative. And I would very much echo what I've just heard in the last speaker's intervention. To achieve uh, reality, the reality of what climate change requires, a very significant gear shift is needed in terms of the policies and approaches. Um, and I can explain why um, and what, what I think is needed there. Um, what I see as the extraordinary opportunity for Gipuzkoa is the fact that a discourse about climate action, about decarbonization, and hopefully more and more about uh, adaptation together with decarbonization, is contextualized within the context of an initiative like Etorki Sunarakais. Because when you look at the problem of climate change from the perspective of someone who does the work I do, which is to work back from what is actually needed by 2030, 2040, 2050, the number one challenge in, in what we need to achieve globally and within Europe is a social transformation that is at the absolute heart of an economic and industrial transformation mm -hmm. that is at the absolute heart of a reconceptualization of our relationship with the natural environment, with the resources, and with one another. And very, very few places in the world have any sense of how to achieve that, how to design for it, how to structure it, how to exercise governance frameworks around it, how to codify for it, how to turn it into practices and uh, collaborations on the ground with all levels of society. In Gipuzkoa, you have a framework for transformation that is a transformation of civic institutions and civil society in partnership grounded in a notion of solidarity, of collective responsibility, of social cohesion and of equality. Its huge opportunity would be to bring ecological trans transformation into the very heart of that program, which it's not at the moment. It is still being in, kind of treated in separate buckets and genuinely design for ecological transformation to be a social transformation uh, together. 
There is the where with all of that. There is the beginnings of that in the deep demonstration. You have the opportunity here. It requires the systemic approach to become more a question of practice and not only a question of theory because there is still many elements. By accident, yesterday, I went to the other sessions uh, because I, I got confused with the rooms. <laughs> so I went to the session on social change and I went to the session on sustainable economics before I came here. And what I heard were elements that must be here. In the social e sustainable economy, there is a whole piece around leadership of SMEs and the transformation of the future of work. It needs to be here. In, in the social transformation, there is the piece around an open book for health care and for the transformation of society in terms of personalized health care that is intrinsic to climate and to climate transformation and to the dealing of major issues around rights and migration. You referred to huge amounts of migration coming forward. We will need to deal with that. This region will need to deal with it because it is so privileged in terms of its environmental health and well-being. So a much more systemic approach on the ground for which the elements are there, a much more transformative scope of ambition that looks for regeneration and for the totally interdependent link between climate change, biodiversity protection, pollution, and regeneration of carbon sinks and carbon stores, and I think a role model for the world. You have the opportunity here not just to lean into climate change, but to build a model that is exportable for how the ecological transformation can be addressed through governance, through social change, and through industry change. And I'll stop because I have so much more to say on the way in which this region could lock itself into the European programming and, and to Europe's priorities in the next 10, 10 years, but I would speak for the next 20 minutes. So let me stop. As a climate uh, scientist, uh, I have to give a few figures because there was a question that has to do with figures and specific parameters. And uh, the question was whether uh, Kiputhkwa uh, is especially impacted by climate change. And the answer is yes, the figures speak for themselves. The uh, temperature increase uh, on the service, uh, the uh, global average in the last century has been 0.96 one degree centigrade. In Spain, it's been 1.5, higher than the average, but in Guipúzcoa, it's been 1.2, but not in 100 years, in the last 50 years. And regarding the rise in sea level since 1990, there's been a rise of 2.5 centimeters per decade, but speeding up quickly, and now it's up to more than three. And uh, Monica told us yesterday that 40 percent of the population in Guipúzcoa lives along the coast, and uh, therefore, uh, the answer is yes, there is a very big impact uh, on the population. And here I have uh, bad news. Uh, Nature Communication, a, a very prestigious uh, magazine uh, in 2019, published uh, a study that uh, tripled the uh, effect of the sea level rise. In the case of Spain, for 2050, 200,000 people will be affected by the rise in sea level and affected means people that at least uh, once a year are going to be flooded. Their homes are going to be flooded. And in the world, it went from 80 million to 200 million people. And uh, therefore, there cannot be more pertinent or relevant than what we're doing here right now, because it's a real urgent uh, problem on the ground. And uh, therefore, it's absolutely pertinent, as Jose Ignacio said, apart from the mitigation, the adaptation policies to climate change are absolutely relevant. Uh, it's going to happen, so we have to adapt to that reality. Well, an example from those of you who have flown here, if uh, the uh, sea level goes up, uh, San Sebastian Airport won't exist. And uh, that's something I remember every time I fly in. That's a basic infrastructure that is already at absolute risk. Yesterday, Jesus, uh, we were talking about Guipúzcoa compared to Spain and uh, Europe. And uh, how is uh, Guipúzcoa uh, placed uh, regarding Spain and Europe uh, today? Do you want to start with Spain? Well, I said uh, during my uh, intervention that there are aspects where Guipúzcoa is uh, clearly in the lead. 
and it's probably the province in Spain where uh, the uh, results in uh, waste uh, management are the most positive regarding attaining uh, the uh, objectives. I'm saying regarding uh, waste management and recycling and the preparation for reutilization, it's clearly an example. And uh, in this sense, it's uh, highly exportable. And there may be other aspects where there's more room for improvement. And uh, uh, to give another example, in the generation of uh, green electricity, although uh, major efforts are being made uh, to uh, promote self-consumption, energy communities, etc., but we probably need more. And what I do believe is uh, that the uh, policies are advanced and ambitious, and uh, connecting this to how Guipúzcoa uh, fits in the context of uh, Spain and uh, the European Union, what I find missing sometimes uh, from the sub-national level is that they should try to influence in a more positive way uh, in the national agenda. In the European Union, for example, at times when we have discussions at the Council, some countries that share a higher level of ambition, uh, countries that are like-minded, they share the same idea and they share positions and they try to promote that agenda to make it more ambitious. And yet when we design uh, policies on a national level, there are participative uh, processes with the autonomous regions and so on, but they're more uh, consultative um, and there are opinions. But we don't see a coalition of uh, ambition that uh, drive us. And it would be very good with this uh, positive experience of the policies in Guipúzcoa and with other uh, territories that may share that ambition, we could say, well, let's uh, not just uh, do things well. Let's uh, try to do things well on a national level. Let's get together to uh, promote things on a national level. Yes, two Jesuses. It's complicated. Yes, some light and some shadow. The light is the circular uh, economy, uh, and the shadow is renewable energy. And Spain, 44%, uh, uh, Guipúzcoa, 8%. But uh, I. Uh, do have to say that I enjoyed the approach uh, of uh, colonizing the rooftops because solar energy is the best distributed energy there is. It reaches practically all roofs and therefore we have to uh, make use of this uh, special feature. Well, I was going to say a bit of the same in areas such as the circular economy. Well, obviously, Guipúzcoa uh, is more advanced than the European average in fields like renewable energy less. But uh, connecting this with what you said, um, on a level of active policies, which is one of the things I wanted to say in my presentation, it's not just a matter of having strategies uh, and lengthy documents, etc., with uh, major goals. It's a matter of implementing them. And I think that many things are being done along those lines here. So I think that the, uh, Gipuza is uh, quite a good example. Build on this. I think there's more to what's happening here than is in this room. Um, but I think that's also about the way in which it's being defined. So, for example, I would be looking, I look at Guipuzcoa and I think of, yes, massive issues with sea level rise. I think of industry, 70% of industry embedded in some of the most high emitting business ch value chains in the world. And these are really hard to change, global automotive, global av aviation, oil and gas, steel. I think about the fact that you have a huge footprint in forestry and bioeconomy and uh, biodiversity, and you're sitting on a continent whose temperature rise is already dramatic, so the movement of migration over, uh, over from the hotlands up towards this area is going to be extreme, significant. How prepared are you for that? And I think about uh, the reality of how to tap into the very significant resources that are here. So the excellence in food systems or in, or in uh, gastronomy or in food innovation, in agricultural, agroforestry, where is that in this conversation? Because it's part of this particular set of, of possibilities. Um, so some of the, the questions that for me I think are really important to answer that are partly about what is being done in a policy perspective and are partly about readiness and capabilities and mindset. So if you have to pivot very fast in industrial transformation, is there a precedent for that in this region? Yes, there is. 
So how do you de tap into that readiness around rapid pivots in industrial transformation and hook them into climate? Because climate, biodiversity, environmental protection should be constituting the number one focus of a strategic innovation for every single SME and industry in this area. Uh, so it feels like there are so many pieces of the puzzle very close together, not quite with that kind of harnessing of a direction and a force. And there are some contexts that might do it. Tomorrow will be published in the European Commission the Industry 5.0 paper that will be published by the group that I'm a part of, the ESIR group. And that is a call to arms for a complete reconceptualization of Europe's industrial strategy to focus primarily on sustainability, the humanization of business, and the harnessing of digital into sustainability and regenerative goals and circularity and regenerative together, instead of having them as a twin but disconnected transition. So I think there are opportunities for this region to, to, to make itself very visible as a lighthouse. But I would very much connect back to what I've heard in several different points. The story needs to be told. It isn't enough for it to be extraordinary. It needs to be told. And for that story then to mobilize the radical actors and the fast followers who start to say, we need to come and talk about collectives, because collectives seem to be capable of doing something that are very hard to produce elsewhere, and at scale. Joaquín. Como ejemplares, veo... I see a general issue uh, that we've seen at this conference, which is the integration of the environmental dimension uh, in uh, the overall uh, provincial policies and the policies of the Diputación. Although I still need to know uh, what's uh, happening with taxes, because if I'm not mistaken, the uh, Basque authorities have tax capabilities, and I haven't heard anything about uh, the uh, tax system uh, focusing on the environmental uh, aspect, neither yesterday nor here today. And this could be a major gap in this general dynamic to integrate uh, the environmental dimension in um, the overall policies. And also uh, in the general terrain, the alignment with the sustainable development goals of the UN. And I don't say this because I come from the UN and because I'm especially uh, sensitive to the issue of the SDGs that I feel very committed to, but because it seems to me that this is a very useful guide, a very useful guide, not just for those responsible for the environment, but for all those politically responsible to align their policies with the SDGs. And uh, if this is accompanied by this uh, fairly complete line of indicators, although I said I didn't exactly know how they work, but uh, it's a good design. And that uh, is also exemplary. And in that sense, uh, you have uh, things that are exemplary, things that can be improved, but they are exemplary. And regarding specific issues, I mentioned them earlier. The energy communities and the energy cooperatives, but of course, uh, Gipuzkoa has uh, an orography and uh, certain geographic structure with uh, a lot of uh, inhabitants, which means that perhaps uh, other uh, renewable projects uh, don't have the same capacity as they have elsewhere. And uh, the idea isn't to do the same everywhere, but uh, in each place to do whatever is most suitable. And this idea of strengthening self-consumption, because there, there is uh, enormous potential, I think that that is very interesting and uh, that's something that we should give a drive to. There is a way of solving that gap with respect to the installation of other types of renewables that are going to have their impact. Uh, and it's not a matter of uh, producing renewables that have an impact on biodiversity. The uh, point is uh, to find the compatibility. And that's why it's uh, important to, uh, to have these self-consumption initiatives for companies and uh, for uh, individual homes. But as an example, and the same goes for waste, especially in a waste collection and uh, there are some initiatives at Natur Klima. We saw yesterday uh, what can be done with this waste, and that's uh, extremely interesting. But as far as the circular economy is concerned, 
I see uh, more of a potential than a reality, although your potential is enormous because you're in an industrial province. And as an industrial province, and because of your characteristics too, the potential you have in the circular economy is enormous. But uh, it's more uh, a potential, the same way that you have enormous potential in uh, making adaptation measures, not just general adaptation policies, but adaptation measures, because you know the territory well, you know uh, the impacts on the territory well and how they're evolving. And from there, you can establish adaptation uh, policies that uh, have very significant potential. I leave it here, but I do think that you are an example and uh, that uh, you have enormous potential in other areas, although there are some gaps that will have to be filled in. Sí. Eh, al hilo de lo que dice Joaquín. Regarding what Joaquín was saying, I fully agree with the analysis, and this is one of the concerns uh, we have. And uh, going to the specifics regarding taxation, yes, we talked about it superficially yesterday, but we've created a group on uh, green uh, uh, taxes in Etorquizuna um, together with the. Um, um, uh, taxation the department, you know, not all of the taxes uh, depend uh, on uh, us. You know that there is a uh, state regulation and there is a capacity to manage. But some things are being done regarding this very shyly, and we need to uh, focus more on taxation. We are aware of this, and this has been perfectly explained by you. Regarding renewable energies, uh, yes. We've just uh, um, uh, passed the approval for two uh, wind farms in Gipuzkoa. It is true that the territory not, is not especially favorable due to our orography, but we are giving steps forward that five, ten years ago um, we couldn't even think about. So we're very aware of this. And uh, home consumption being uh, fostered through energy communities and cooperatives is very important. Yesterday, we didn't have time to explain this, but we want to do this also with our industrial parks, what we call industrial deas. But the same things we're doing with cooperatives is something we're working on at an industrial level. And we will see how this uh, progresses. We're working on pilot projects and then hydrogen as a possible substitute for fossil fuels. We're all aware that this is not something that can happen from one day to the other. And it will take us a decade to uh, create this uh, uh, change and to be efficient. But we've uh, already uh, started on this. And I fully agree with your analysis, and Joaquin, I agree with uh, your analysis. We are aware. I wanted to uh, tell you this, but of course, I think that a uh, picture of the uh, territory is uh, very um, um, correct. Regarding circular economy, maybe I'm more of an optimist than you are. I think a new way of doing things is um, part of the uh, uh, fabric now. We are achieving high numbers of uh, collaboration with technology centers and the industry because we have an industry beyond uh, big companies, big companies for us that at an international level are um, medium-sized, uh, CAF, Irizar, Orona, Inda, which are the biggest in our territory. They are uh, seem to be big for us, but they are middle-sized for the European level. We have an... Uh, ecosystem of more uh, small enterprises. And Kristen also uh, mentioned this in her analysis. With this industry, we need to find the synergies and the collaboration so that in Gipuzkoa, we don't have uh, the traditional collaboration between university and uh, the industry. So we are uh, focusing on this, and we've uh, mm, allowed it to grow uh, recently. So regarding uh, chemical uh, recycling of uh, plastics, this is a more a public initiative than a private initiative. It is true that uh, 
It is more a public initiative of the department because we are aware that we have a, a sector that is very uh, powerful and international and uh, competitive. But uh, from Europe with uh, fees, taxes, and so on and so forth, this could mean that in a decade it doesn't exist. It has been uh, very well received, and the collaboration of the sector is very important. But it's more a public initiative than a private one. So yes, um, we have uh, the reality we have, but we are starting to work more in circular economy, and it's becoming a most more robust uh, movement. Yes, it has potential. Yes, I understood what you've said, and I agree with everything you've said. But uh, and the issue of energy, it's uh, clear. This is a uh, something that we have to look towards in a medium long term. We have to make a great effort. The uh, path of transformation is one that we've already started on, but we are. Um, uh, just uh, um, at the starting point. So we need to really accelerate and speed this process up. I'm seeing the Thumarraga uh, uh, mayor, and they, they have five uh, public buildings uh, with uh, uh, panels, solar panels now, and they will be able to create these communities, and they want to get up to a 25% in this uh, uh, middle-sized uh, town in Gipuzkoa. So, of course, there's still a lot to be done, but we are at the starting point, and that's everything I had to say regarding this. Talking about communities and cooperatives, yesterday, Jesus Alquezar said that he also missed ideas uh, that were smaller ideas, not so much about uh, cooperatives and communities, and that could be an example for Europe. Could you explain what you missed uh, when you mentioned this? In other cities, in other places in Europe, they are really uh, fostering self-consumption. For example, in Brussels, that I don't believe is the uh, uh, paradigm of ecologic uh, policies, they have uh, many uh, problems, but there are um, uh, aids uh, to have your own solar panels. It is also true that the structure of the city is very different because there are many individual homes. So you can have your own solar panels and that's it, and you um, manage your own uh, energy. And when we talked about cooperatives and communities, which I believe is a brilliant idea, and uh, that I believe that, in fact, we should uh, disseminate more. And when we talk about the, the future initiatives in the commission, but what I really missed is this um, help, these uh, subsidies for self-consumption and self-production. But this is uh, more um, targeted towards individual homes. It can also be targeted to uh, apartment buildings, but probably uh, the um, roof is not big enough for uh, everyone living there. Maybe you can cover uh, common expenses, but it's not something that will bring us to 100% self-consumption. But I also believe there's a potential here, and I really don't know everything you're doing. Maybe there are things that I didn't hear about. While we get the mic to you, I would like to say that the ministry, through the IDAE, channeling uh, the uh, subsidies of the Next Generation Funds through the Recovery Fund, in fact, is uh, uh, fostering self-consumption in uh, individual uh, homes and also uh, energy communities. So this is what we're uh, walk, working on in all administrations. Good morning. My name is Juancho Sabadiel. I'm the president of a cooperative made up by 600 people here in San Sebastian. And we've had district heating for 32 years. We are pioneers in the Spanish uh, state. We produce uh, um, heating uh, for the uh, neighborhood of Vera Vera in the outskirts of the city. For me, this conference on ecological transition has been a very important opportunity. It's been very important to have the support of the uh, Provincial Council. And we've talked with both Jose Ignacio and Monica, who have opened their doors to us, and we will continue collaborating with them. 32 years ago, 
when you were going to purchase a home at Vera Vera, it really caught your attention that the construction company showed you the um, building and you said, there's no radiators. Where is the uh, uh, heating system uh, for this uh, home? And they say, you see that uh, building over there in that other um, area? There's a thermal uh, uh, plant that uh, brings heating to the whole neighborhood. That's why don't you have an individual uh, boiler. So one of the things that I wanted to transmit is that there is a lack of definition from the uh, um, uh, EU, the IDAE, the EBE, the different institutions, because depending on who you talk with, they tell you they are, you are an energy community. In other places, they say you are a cooperative. So it's not uh, very well defined, and we suffer this with uh, uh, different institutions. We do have a relationship with them. But what do I mean by all of this? If we're going to promote this kind of uh, energy communities, we, we have it here in, in San Sebastian. And we've uh, gone through the different stages. We uh, worked uh, with production from uh, uh, to gas. Now we have a cogeneration with one megabat, uh, megawatt. We have uh, also a generation of electricity that is also sold to Iberdrola. We are now studying issues of uh, self-consumption and photovoltaic uh, um, in uh, the whole neighborhood, everything we can generate regarding energy. So we're on the front line, let's say. When I hear you speak about communities, I wanted for you to define it uh, specifically because wherever, uh, when you go from one place to the other, they treat you in a different way. Of course, I know that the doors to the provincial council are open, so I just wanted to make this comment so that you have a more clear and uh, homogeneous definition. We have to be finishing now. Yesterday, you talked about the lack of uh, communication or a bad communication or that we don't sell uh, ourselves, that we are very much from Guipuzcoa doing many things but not uh, um, disseminating this information. Are we as bad as you say? Please be free. Well, in general, uh, administrations are not good at selling themselves. So I cannot uh, give lessons because we do exactly the same thing. It is uh, very difficult to transfer the message of what you're doing um, well, and what you're good at, and there's different issues uh, uh, involved there. The civil servants uh, sometimes are a bit in our cave, focused on our work, and we don't pay attention to how to transmit this information, which is also important, which is one of their main uh, deficits. Uh, to work more on communication. So I think we have to work with communication uh, teams. So I cannot give any advice because I don't believe we are a good example of uh, communicating. The environment is quite uh, hostile when things are done uh, well. In general, good news are not news. And this is a reality. What I, we do know and what we perceive is that in the Basque country, uh, the, you live well, living conditions are good. And after overcoming uh, specific uh, problems that have been overcome here in the Basque country, things go well. But this would be uh, at a comprehensive uh, level. Employment uh, um, rates are better than in the rest of Spain, also stability, also incomes. So uh, welfare state in general. And this is a part, whether we like it or not, this is a part of this uh, uh, situation that has to do w more with uh, the welfare state. And I believe this is a, a story of success. But the other stories that are more specific, for example, yesterday you talked about this uh, award uh, on and that this was only one of the um, it's pages that you don't even look at in the newspaper, but it is normal because there are things that have to do with waste, recycling, and so on and so forth that are not news anymore. So my advice is that you try to find uniqueness, what is uh, singular. This issue of uh, communities and uh, cooperatives can be 
an important issue because now the price of uh, 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 energy is on the news, it's on the headlines, it's uh, opening the news on the television. These figures that you talked about yesterday for self-consumption and I family is very interesting. So things like this at the adequate point in time it could be so but you would have to study how you at the right time are there and give the information this also means that you need to have a people in a good communication team that knows how to do it and transmit in a successful way and always try and find the controversy with no controversy there's no news that's my advice but uh, the important thing is that we need to continue progressing, that citizenship sees the progress and uh, feels uh, engaged. And uh, as um, they say in my uh, town, if the quality is good, then you will be able to sell it. I think one question. Uh, I am a visitor and a guest here, so I practice the habit of going out and asking people on the streets and the taxi drivers or the people in the bus stations, what is a Turkisunere case? What do you know about it? It's an interesting set of answers. Uh, they do not answer me that it's all about uh, sustainability and prosperity in the context of climate change, so there's an opportunity to close that gap. Um, I think you have a massive opportunity that will be coming up literally in the next year, and that is within the context of Horizon Europe and the European missions. There is a mission on climate adaptation. We are already leading the beginnings of the mission on cities. There is an opportunity for, there is a call for 100 regions to put themselves forward as lighthouse areas or as areas that will either close massive gaps or do advanced experimentation and demonstration on how to address climate adaptation, climate transformation, and of course decarbonization is at the core of that as well. So there is an opportunity to put yourselves really on the map. Being quiet achievers is a very good thing if then you can leapfrog forward into demonstrating what is possible for other regions to copy. And the challenges that we are discussing here are the challenges that everybody faces. Circular economy is so often referred to as a solution to end all problems. And when you look at it, it always comes down to a much too narrow uh, dealing with waste instead of a reconceptualization of design in the first place. And so often with energy, it's a substitution game as opposed to a complete reconfiguration of the way we think about infrastructure. I would continue to argue when we're talking about retrofit Think about health. The digital infrastructure that we need for energy efficiency is the same digital infrastructure we need for an aging population and for tele-education in a world where we have to change the way we move and the way we work. So there are opportunities because this is such a concentration of capabilities and of political will to act that does offer you the opportunity to platform Gipuzkoa in the context of missions, in the context of the Just Transformation Initiative, and in the context of the global call for arms that is happening. I'm gonna finish uh, at COP this year in Glasgow. We launched the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. It is the connecting, the, the activation of a space for action for sub-national actors to connect directly with the UNF C process, and it is very much about a mission-led demonstration of systemic change through radical collaboration. Those are the key words for that initiative. It's, we are actively building it now. It was launched in Glasgow. There is another opportunity to place what is happening here on a global stage. Thank you. We need to finish. Well, you talked about the uh, festival in San Sebastian, the uh, red carpet, which is made by a recycled uh, material, and no one talked about it. And we said maybe instead of being red, it being green, everyone would have talked about it. So we need to try and create an impact. That's what we try and uh, to do. Sorry, there are comments of Mike. Uh, re I'm really sorry, but we need to uh, finish. Uh, uh, please uh, come up here so that we can take a picture. Monica and Asensio, please join us. And we finish the session here. And I ask all the guests to please uh, go to the big uh, cube, to the auditorium. Thank you. And you can continue the plenary session that will start in seven minutes. Thank you.